Hi y'all and welcome back to Professor True Love's Concepts for Nurses series and I am Professor Terry True Love. And in this episode, part of the High Acuity Nursing series, we will be looking at burns. And in this episode, the assessment of burns. Sources for this episode include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing and Soul's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing. The pathophysiology of burn injury results in changes to the skin from that burn injury. There can be anatomical changes. Because of those skin and anatomical changes, there may be functional changes, and especially during the recovery phase, there could be temperature changes. That is, the patient being unable to maintain a proper temperature. The severity of a burn is determined by how much body surface is involved, as well as the depth of that burn. Differences in skin thickness in various parts of the body factor into determining how these burns are graded. When looking at depth, you should know that superficial thickness burns incur the least amount of damage. The epidermis in a superficial thickness burn is only is the only part of the skin that is injured. Desquamitation, that is peeling of the dead skin, occurs two to three days after the burn. Partial thickness burns involve the entire epidermis and parts of the dermis to various depths. That depth helps to categorize these burns as either superficial, superficial partial thickness, partial thickness, or deep partial thickness injuries. In a full thickness burn, there is a destruction of the entire epidermis and the dermis. The skin does not regrow. The body's response to the burn occurs in phases. The resuscitation or early phase of the burn injury continues for about 24 to 48 hours after the burn until diuresis occurs. The assessment of the body systems is essential at this point because you have goals that include securing the airway, supporting circulation through fluid replacement, preventing infection, maintaining body temperature, and providing emotional support. The assessment of body systems should start with the assessment of the respiratory system. Injuries to the respiratory system can include direct airway injury, carbon monoxide poisoning, thermal injury, that is heat injuries, things like breathing in superheated gases, smoke poisoning, pulmonary fluid overload, external factors such as damage to the chest or chest wall preventing proper expansion of the lungs, and facial edema. Pulmonary fluid overload occurs even when lung tissues have not been directly damaged. Histamine and other inflammatory mediators cause the capillaries to leak fluid into the pulmonary tissue space. This, of course, interferes with gas exchange. An important part of the cardiovascular assessment includes to look for signs of hypovolemic shock. It is a very common cause of death in the early phase of patients with serious injuries. That means to monitor the vital signs very frequently and monitor the cardiac rhythm, particularly in cases of electrical burn injuries, including but not limited to lightning strikes. Review of the cardiac system should prompt an assessment about vascular changes resulting from burn injuries because there are fluid shifts. Third spacing or capillary leak syndrome, which usually occur occurs in the first 12 hours, but can continue for 24 to 36 hours. There is a profound imbalance of fluid, electrolyte, acid base statuses, including hyperkalemia in hyponatremia levels. There can also be hemoconcentration. Fluid is remobilized after a 24 hour. The diuretic stage begins 48 to 72 hours after the injury, and hyponatremia and hypokalemia can continue unless there are proper interventions. 
The assessment for the burn patient should include a kidney and urinary assessment. You should remember that changes related to cellular debris will result in decreased kidney blood flow. Myoglobin released from damaged muscle circulates to the kidney and can clog the glomerulus. In this case, kidney function, blood urea nitrogen, serum creatinine, and serum sodium levels can all be at risk. So therefore, assess the urine color, the odor, and the presence of particulates and foam. Continuing, the skin assessment, remember, shows the size and the depth of the injury. Let's talk a little bit about the size of the injury, where we will look at the percentage of the total body surface area affected. We will be using the rule of nines, using multiples of 9% to determine the total body surface area affected by the burn. This image gives you an idea of the rule of nines, and there are many different tools to determine rule of nines. As long as you are consistent within your facility, there is no overall guidance to which tool you use. When using the rule of nines, simply determine how much of the patient's has been burnt and then apply it to this particular tool. For instance, in this case, if the patient had most of the front part of their chest and their abdomen burned, we would rate that where it says front 18%, we would say that that results in an 18% burn. And if this same patient also had the right extremity burn, we would add another 9% to that total for a total of 27%. Therefore, the patient who had the anterior chest and the right arm burnt, according to this chart, would have a total body surface area burn of 27%. The gastrointestinal assessment is also important because changes in GI function are expected. This is because of a decreased blood flow and the sympathetic stimulation during the early phase. They cause reduced GI motility. They can even cause paralytic ileus. These can lead to such complications as GI bleeding, curling's ulcer, and remember, these patients need high amounts of nutrition, and now their GI tract has slowed down or even stopped. These occur as well as appetite suppression because of changes in their metabolism. So a metabolic assessment should include looking for increased secretions of catecholamines, antidiuretic hormone, aldosterone, and cortisol, the stress chemicals. Increased core body temperature as response to temperature regulation by the hypothalamus is often seen after the patient begins to recover from the burn. Nursing and medical interventions for the patient suffering from burns is directly related to a proper, thorough, and rapid assessment of the area that has been injured. That does conclude this episode, however, there is another episode where we will review interventions related to patients suffering from burns. In the meantime, learned a little bit. I hope you plan on coming back to listen to some more, and if you are, we'll see you then.